Welcome to Hot Chips 33. Tutorial 1 Machine Learning Performance and Challenges. Welcome everyone to the last session of our ML tutorial. So we talked you through um, overview of different deep learning workloads and their computational characteristics. We talked about MLPerf. Uh, we talked about uh, some optimizations which can be done for training and inference, and also had a really nice uh, discussion about what else constitutes a deep learning workload. It's not only training or inference, also a lot of data preprocessing. And this last session will be focused on some challenging workloads uh, also related to training deep neural networks. Uh, but the, the very first talk will be focused on graph neural networks. This is a type of neural networks which are becoming, I think, more and more popular. Uh, we have not seen yet uh, a lot of hardware optimizations for those. Uh, they have quite different uh, characteristics of compute, require a lot of scatter gather operations operations on sparse data, uh, which are not typical for other types of deep neural networks, and thus uh, might be challenging for traditional uh, architectures. And then in the two additional talks, we'll talk about extreme scale uh, of deep learning workloads and what it takes to run those on uh, distributed clusters of the hardware and what kind of tricks you can employ to uh, do that fast and in optimal way. So with that, I'm happy to introduce uh, the first speakers in this last session. Uh, the talk will be given by Da Zheng and uh, George uh, Karipis. Uh, they will be talking about, as I mentioned, graph neural networks, uh, different types of those neural networks and what kind of applications uh, use, uses those neural networks and how they are different from whatever else we have in deep learning world. So Da Zheng is a senior applied scientist in um, AWS, AWS AI, where he develops deep learning frameworks, including MXNet, uh, DeepGraph library, and uh, DJLIKE. His research interests include high-performance computing, scalable machine learning systems, and data mining. He got a PhD in computer science at the Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore in 2017. Uh, he received his Master of Science from Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne uh, in Switzerland and Bachelor of Science from Zhejiang University in China. And George uh, Karipis is a senior principal scientist in, uh, at AWS AI and a distinguished McKnight University professor and an ADC chair of digital technology at the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. His research interests uh, span the areas of data mining, high-performance computing, informational retrieval, collaborative filtering, bioinformatics, chemoinformatics, and scientific computing. Uh, you can read more about uh, his accomplishments in the Slack where I posted a detailed uh, bio. With that, uh, I'm passing to Da and George to tell us about graph neural networks. Oh. Oh. Okay, thank you for the introduction. And uh, hello, everybody. And thank you for attend, uh, attending our presentation. Uh, we are part of the AWS team that is developing the Deep Graph Library, um, the open source software framework for writing, training, and applying graph neural networks. And the graph neural network is a class of deep learning models that are applied to graphs with arbitrary connections between nodes. Computation on graphs leads to irregular, compute, uh, irregular and sparse data access pattern and the characteristics of computation in graph neural network um, are different from traditional deep learning workloads. In this talk, um, we will first present an overview of graph neural networks, describe their sparse computation kernels and how they are trained. After that, uh, we will present an empirical analysis of how showing how the computation are split between uh, sparse computations and the dense computations by taking into account different graph neural network models and different training methods and execution patterns, uh, sorry, execution platforms. Um, 
We hope that those results, by showing what, uh, what is the current state of that, will provide some insight on what needs to be further optimized and force the new research, er uh, new research in this area. Um, before getting into the actual detail of the, of the talk, the first, uh, the first question that I would like to answer is, why do we care about graph new networks? So the answer um, is basically graph machine learning, which uh, uh, broadly refers to a set of machine learning techniques that operates on graph data and is used in many areas. So for example, in social networks, graph and machine learning is used to identify influencers, bad actors, uh, moderate content, and, and many others. In e-commerce, graph ML is used for recommendations, product ranking, ad targeting, and others. And in knowledge graph, graph ML is used to identify missing information and a question and answering. And then in our software development, graph ML can be used to identify and fix bugs. And in drug discovery, a graph ML is used to select and design effect drugs for existing and novel diseases. This represents just a small a fraction of the application domains. Um, in the past few years, we actually have seen um, graph ML to be applied to a broader set of domains and problems. And these domains give rise to graphs that have a um, wide range of characteristics. Some of them involve extremely large graphs. So for example, uh, social networks has billions of nodes and edges. Whereas in other areas, the graphs are small, but many. For example, in the drug discovery, the, gra the graphs are, um, often have uh, only 20 to 1,000 uh, nodes, but billions of them. In addition to that, some of the graphs are actually homogeneous. That means a graph has only one node types and one edge types. But most of the real world graphs are actually heterogeneous. That means a graph has uh, multiple node types and multiple edge types. So this heterogeneity actually makes the graph modeling and the computation much more complex. Um, Graph new network is a very popular deep learning technique for graph machine learning. This technique is becoming in increasingly popular as shown in the chart on the right. So the basic idea of graph new network is to learn the embedding of a target node with both its own features as well as its neighbor's features. Uh, these embeddings will be used for any downstream tasks uh, on the node. The, Learning of the embeddings are supervised by, um, the down, uh, by the downstream task, thus we can potentially learn a better model with graph new network. So here, uh, now let's uh, take a look, a deeper look, and, and take a, a little bit deeper to see how graph new network works. So graph new network can be formulated as a message passing. So the basic idea is that um, no, a node can send a message to there adjacent nodes, basically neighbors. And then each node aggregates all the messages received from um, its neighbors and then use those messages to update its own representation. The process of message passing can be customized with uh, three functions. On, on, each node, on each edge, we can define a message function to generate a message. On each node, we can define an aggregation function to aggregate messages from its neighbors, and then finally define a function to transform the aggregation result along with their its own node features to generate the final node embedding. The message function and the node update function themselves usually requires a dense operations, while the aggregation function and the generating messages on existing edges will be transformed into uh, sparse operations. So here um, we show two uh, sparse operations that capture the simplified uh, node-wise operation and edge-wise edge operation shown in the previous slide. So um, this STDMM, namely um, sample the dense, dense matrix, matrix multiplication takes a row U from the left matrix X 
and a row V from the right matrix Y and perform dot product. If the sparse matrix has a non-zero value in row U and column V. And we can use this operation to generate messages on edges in a graph. The other sparse operation is sparse dense matrix multiplication. This actually is the simplest version of the node wise operation. In this operation, to, uh, to, com to compute the node uh, output row U, um, we, we sum over all rows V of matrix X, where the sparse matrix A has non zero values in row U and column V. Um, so both SPMM and SDN, uh, uh, so both SPMM and SDDMM can be generalized. For SDDMM, instead of doing a dot product in the location of uh, each non-zero value of A, we can um, uh, over the sparse matrix A, we can replace the dot product with a, a phi function. Similarly, we can replace the aggregation function on each output uh, on each output row. Um, with a row function in, S, uh, in SPMM. We can even redefine the computation on the rows of matrix X with the non-zero values of A. Um, now, after we have seen um, the general formulation of graph new networks and the two specialized uh, uh, sparse matrix, uh, 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 under the two specialized sparse matrix operations. Now let's uh, look at some examples. Um, graph Sage is a simple graph neural network model that runs on a graph with one node type and one edge type. We can see that in Graph Sage, uh, messages are just the neighbor node features. For each node V, we sum over all its neighbor, sum over its, all its neighbor's features and divide the result with the degree of node V. This basically computes the average of node, uh, neighbor nodes embeddings. After we can compute the average of the neighbor's features, we multiply the aggregation result with, the, uh, with a weight matrix and then multiply the node, node's own features with another uh, weight matrix. Then we sum these two uh, uh, multiplication results and go through a nonlinear function. The process can be computed by, uh, by the code on the right, where the message passing is uh, computed by a, by a STMN, followed by a few dense operations. And another example is a graph attention network, which is a much more complex model. In this model, we uh, still sum the agree, uh, neighbor's uh, features to compute the target node embeddings. Um, the summation is weighted by the attention score um, between, the node, uh, between the neighbor node and the target node. To compute, uh, the, to compute the, uh, the attention score, we first project the, um, the, the node features to compute a new node embed. And then we apply a left attention vector um, on the target node embedding and a right attention vector on the uh, neighbor node embedding to generate two um, scalar values. We sum these two scalar values on each edge to compute attention score. And then we further apply a softmax on each neighborhood to normalize those attention scores. On the right, we can see that, uh, uh, see, um, that the attention score uh, on each edge is computed by um, by, uh, by, uh, by SDDMM and the message passing is computed by STMM. And uh, uh, in most real world settings, the underlying graph actually are heterogeneous as I mentioned earlier. So for, for heterogeneous graph, the simplest graph neural network model actually is the relational graph attention network, RGCN. So in this model, uh, where we, we generate messages uh, for message passing, when we generate messages for message passing, we apply a projection on the weight uh, the neighbor node features. 
um, the projection matrix is different from dif uh, is different for different edge types. Uh, to perform RGCN computation, we need we need to first sort the edge in the graph. Um, on the right, we can see uh, we need need first to sort the edges. Um, in, in a graph so that all the edges in the same type are, are stored in continuously. We, we then copy the node features to edges as edge features. And then we split the edge features so that the edges of each edge type are stored in separate tensors. And then we, and then we can perform a matrix multiplication on edge feature tensors. And, the, and in the end, we can candidate all the results back to a single tensor. And at the last, we perform STMM um, for message passing to compute the final node embedding. Now uh, let's uh, take a look at how graph new networks are trained. So um, when we perform message passing, we can perform uh, these operations um, multiple times on each, uh, in, on each node so that a node can get information from multiple hops away. Then each message passing corresponds to a graph new network layer. Um, by doing message passing on every node in a graph, we need to uh, we, uh, we, we need to train a graph new network models with all the nodes and edges present in the forward and backward computation. We usually refer to um, this training method as a full graph training. So this uh, the full graph training is usually um, is usually applied on small graphs because it has a very uh, it has memory consumption at least a linear to the number of nodes in your graph. Alternatively, we actually can also sample mini batches from a graph to train graph new networks. Um, but the mini batch sampling on a graph is very different from mini batch sampling for other models such as CV and NLP. Here, um, um, when, uh, when, we, when we sample, uh, sorry, here we need to first uh, sample the target nodes where we will uh, make a prediction. Um, so those, uh, one, the target, and so the blue node is one of the target nodes. And then we sample the neighbors of the target node as shown, as shown on the right figure. A mini batch um, can be much smaller than a full graph. And therefore we can uh, train a graph neural network model on a very large graph. So if we compare the full graph training and the mini batch training, um, full graph training performs one model update per epoch, which involves all the nodes and edges in a graph. While mini batch training performs one model update per batch, which involves a, a subset of nodes and edges. The figure on the right shows the training time um, until the model converge. We can see uh, mini batch training is much faster than full graph training for both graph Sage and the GAT on, on this OGB product graph. This, uh, this graph actually has only um, 2 million nodes. We actually expect that the, the, the gap um, will be even much larger if the graph is larger. So now uh, with all the basic introduction of graph neural network models and the training methods. Now let's uh, talk about the, uh, the GM benchmark we developed to show the characteristics of GM uh, computation. We select, uh, so in this benchmark, we select graphs of different types, namely uh, uh, homoge both homogeneous graph and heterogeneous graphs. Um, we also choose graphs of different sizes because we found different training methods have very large impact on the characteristics of GM computation. So in the end, we pick four data sets, um, two homogeneous graphs, uh, two heterogeneous graphs. Two of them are small, where we can run full graph training on a single GPU. And then two of them are medium size, uh, but uh, two, uh, are large enough so that we, we cannot run full graph training on GPUs. And then, uh, so in, on those uh, larger graphs, we will apply mini batch training. So, and, and we use the DGL as the benchmark framework. 
So as I mentioned earlier, EGEL is a popular framework for graph neural network. So this framework provides a sparse matrix operations such as SPMM and SDDMM. It is well integrated with the deep learning framework such as PyTorch so that we can use the dense operations from PyTorch in graph neural network models. So in this benchmark, we will use DGL for the sparse operations and uh, PyTorch for dense operations. Um, now let's see some experiment, experiment results using uh, full, uh, full graph training in GPU. So we first benchmark um, graph, uh, graph Sage with a full graph training on small graph. We can see, so we can see that both sparse operations and the dense operations have roughly the same amount of running time. And similarly, um, even though uh, GAT, as, uh, here is the result of GAT. So even though a GAT is a much more complex model than graph Sage, um, it's a full graph training has roughly the same amount, the same running time in uh, sparse operations and dense operations. Um, however, on RGCN, it's, it's very different from the previous models. In RGCN, we need to perform, um, uh, so in RGCN, uh, the sparse operations takes actually much less time than dense operations. So the, the re main reason um, that happens is that we need to perform many dense operations on each edge type separately. This may introduce some kernel launching overhead in GPU. Also, we, uh, in our implementation, we first copy the node features to edges, which results in much larger tensor where we need to perform dense um, computation. And that's why um, the dense operations um, now uh, is much more, much more expensive. Okay, now let's see some experiment results using mini band training. The result is actually quite different. Um, so uh, for mini band training, there are actually two ways to perform mini band training in GPU. So if the graph data is small enough to be, uh, to be completely stored in GPU memory, then we can perform all the operations required by mini batch computation in GPU. But if the graph data is, uh, is large, we have to store the graph data in CPU and then perform mini batch computation in GPU. And in this case, we, we, we refer to this case as a mixed the GPU, uh, GPU so sorry, mixed the CPU GPU training. So in the following benchmark, we will show both of them. So first, let's see um, the mini bad training of graph stage in GPU uh, with purely in, in GPU, with GPU. So we can see that the significant amount of time actually is spent in um, constructing a mini batch. And so um, the, which includes both sampling the neighbors and copying all the features required by a mini batch. And also for mini batch computation, SPMM is no longer so expensive compared with the dense operations in graph stage. So this is because uh, the neighbor sampling uh, uh, algorithm we are using result in a very sparse subgraph. So in, this, uh, in these subgraphs, the number of nodes is roughly the same number of edges. So that's why uh, we can see uh, dense operations become so, uh, so much more expensive. Um, however, when we perform the mini batch training or graph stage for mixed CPU and GPU, and now mini batch construction in CPU basically dominates the entire computation. I mean, this is not really surprising because graph stage has a very lightweight computation uh, on, 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 uh, on the graph structure. So this shows that um, with this result, we can see that in, in order to optimize the mixed CPU and GPU uh, mini batch training for graph stage, we have to focus on reducing the amount of computation or, uh, overhead for neighbor sampling. We need to reduce the amount of node features copied to GPU. And then we are, need to try our best to overlap the copy of uh, node features with all other operations. 
Um, unlike a graph stage, GAT is actually much uh, more expensive. So uh, when we perform uh, all operations in GPU, the overhead of mini batch construction actually is quite small. Instead, the dense operations become the most expensive operation. Um, we can see um, the element-wise operations is actually the, uh, the is uh, actually particularly expensive. This is because it is caused by the the broadcast operation um, we are using to uh, to generate the multi-head attention scores. So this broad, uh, broadcast operation generates a very large tensor with dimension uh, uh, equ uh, equal to the number of uh, neighbor nodes, neighbor nodes times the number of heads times of the, dim um, the feature dimensions before we perform the summation to compute the attention score. So when we um, use uh, mixed CPU, GPU mini batch training for GAT, um, even though the mini batch construction in CPU becomes more expensive, and the GAT mini batch computation is still the expensive part of the computation. So uh, we, in this, for this model, actually, um, this may, I mean, uh, this actually makes it possible for us to hide the overlap, uh, uh, so hide the overhead of neighbor sampling and copy the node feature. In the end, uh, we'll, uh, we'll show some re show the result of the RGCN um, uh, result, uh, 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 result, computation result. So sim uh, um, RGCN mini batch computation in GPU is actually quite lightweight. So, um, yeah, so, so, so this makes the mini batch const construction relatively expensive. Um, like the full graph training, dense operations in RGCN mini batch training are actually also much more expensive in uh, sparse operations. And then when we use uh, a mixed CPU and GPU training, um, without surprising that um, the mini batch construction in CPU becomes the um, uh, most uh, expensive operation for training RGCN. So in summary, I mean, what we can see here is that for GN workloads, both sparse operation and dense operation are very important. And the, the training method actually has very large impact on GN workloads. So for full graph training, both sparse uh, and dense operation accounts for half of the runtime for some of the, uh, for, for some of the uh, GN models. But, uh, but then for mini batch training, actually dense, um, dense operations dominate the computation. And if the graph is too large, we have to use mixed CPU GPU training. Then the mini batch sampling uh, may become the uh, may cause the significant overhead. And and it, that's all for uh, for this presentation. Thank you, Da, uh, for uh, talk, <clears throat> telling us about uh, some of their key features and characteristics of uh, training graph neural networks. I think we have maybe time for one question. I don't see any questions on Slack, but I do have a question on my own. So I've noticed that uh, in most of your benchmarks, you used very shallow neural networks. So you use two layers, forget, like two or three layers. Uh, do you believe that in the future uh, we will see deeper graph neural networks? I think some recent publications uh, tried to train much deeper uh, graph neural networks. And if he asks how that would impact the balance of these sparse dense computations, will, will the picture change or not? Sure. So yes, and um, we, are, we are seeing uh, people perform, I mean, doing, re uh, doing research to study how to uh, apply graph neural network to a much, much deeper, I mean, uh, uh, to construct a much, much deeper graph neural network models. But usually those models are actually not applied on like social network or on you know, or e-commerce graph. It is more like applied on like uh, um, a, a point cloud or some uh, some graph that is sparser and more regular. Um, so, but if we if we um, if we want to see uh, see how the computation actually pattern actually change with a deeper um, graph neural network, I would say if we don't change the uh, mini batch sampling algorithm. 
uh, most likely the uh, the the uh, the the computation characteristics of graph neural network will probably be more more or less the same as what, what we have seen so far. Um, but I, I think that I mean we here in our presentation we actually show um, the results for one particular mini batch sampling algorithm. If we change the sampling algorithm, we actually can potentially see different kind of computation patterns. Thank you. Um, there is a follow-up question also on Slack. Um, can you comment how deep are genomes typically for different domains? And uh, also to add from me, why do you think they are not as deep as uh, in other domains? Oh, sure, sure. So typically uh, for social network or some, some graph like that, a graph with like power law distribution, um, um, the graph is usually, I mean, the, we usually use two or three layers. Uh, I haven't, I mean, maybe it's four, four layer is possible, but usually we use two or three layers. Um, sorry, can you say again, what is the question? The question was how deep are GNNs typically? Uh, and the add-on question from me, what prevents, why do you think oh, the okay. models are typically shallow? Right, right, so yeah, so I mean, it's, uh, typically it's two or three layers. But um, I mean, the, the reason that we cannot apply very, very deep graph neural network models on like a social network or something, or power law graph, is that if we extend to multiple hops, we actually now need to gather a very, very large uh, number of neighbors. That makes the training um, very difficult. Also, when we use uh, more and more hops, then we, uh, we actually will encounter a, a, a problem called oversmoothing. So basically, the, the power of graph neural network actually gets weaker. Um, and then uh, it's, it's more like uh, when you make a prediction, uh, or you always uh, predict some, uh, the same thing for every node. Thank you. Um, thank you for answering the questions. Uh, again, if there are any follow-up questions, please feel free to uh, post them in the Slack channel, and uh, Diane and George will uh, answer those in Slack. With that, I will uh, pass the introduction to the next uh, tutorial to Varsika. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 33rd Hot Chips Conference. Uh, I am Vartika Singh, and I lead the Strategic Technical Alliances for NVIDIA's Deep Learning frameworks, compilers, and the associated libraries. I will be your session chair for the remaining segment of this tutorial, which is large language models, and the optimizations with the relevant accelerators and hardware infrastructure. We hope that you have enjoyed the talks of this tutorial session so far, uh, which uh, my co-organizers, David, Natalia, and myself, we helped put together. Please continue to use the respective Slack channels to post the follow-up questions. The speakers will follow up over there with you. So coming up to the last category of the session, we have large language models, uh, as I mentioned earlier. The first talk in this series is by Samir Kumar from Google. He will be talking about optimizations and large-scale training of transformers on Google TPUs. Samir comes from a high-performance computing and supercomputing background. Samir received his PhD from University of Illinois from in 2005. Samir was a research staff member at IBM TJ Watson Research Center from 2006 to 2017, where he worked on IBM supercomputers, including three generations of blue gene, IBM blue gene machines. In his current role as a software engineer at the Google Core AI team, he works in large language models on the large TPU pods. So from here, I give it over to Samir. Hi, and welcome to the Hot Chips tutorial. In this talk, I will present challenges in large-scale training of transformers on Google TPU machines. First, acknowledgments to all our collaborators. I'll begin with a brief description of the neural scaling laws, which was presented in a recent paper from OpenAI. In this paper, the authors study, uh, they actually plot the loss 
by increasing compute data set and parameter size and they show that the loss continues to improve and reduce as we increase compute data size and parameters and they suggest in the paper that this could continue for two more orders of magnitude beyond GPT-3 which has about 200 billion parameters. More on neural scaling laws, uh, the authors claim that uh, larger models need fewer samples and can achieve higher quality. All these are great incentives for ML scientists to train larger and larger models. Some examples of giant models, OpenAI GPT-3, 200 billion parameters, the Google G Shard mixture of experts went up to 1 trillion parameters, and switch transformers go further than that to 1.6 trillion parameters. Note G Shard and switch transformers use sparsity to enable training of very, very large models. Other examples are the Google Lambda model and the T5 text to text transformer framework. Uh, the Google architecture for TPUs has 400 teraflops per chip in the V3 generation, and it's interconnected in a 2D toroidal mesh network at 100 petaflops. Recently, our CEO announced the Google TPU V4. This is a picture of the TPU V4 card, and uh, note the cooling units are in parallel, are more optimized over the previous generation where the cooling unit was liquid cooled in series. This is a picture of the Google TPU pod with 4,000 chips. Recently, we submitted MLPerf results on the 4,000 chips. We went up to 3,456 chips and uh, we achieve between 1.5 to 2.2x speed up over the 0.7 submission round. N note these speed ups are at scale, the speed ups are higher at smaller scales. In addition, we were able to achieve the record times in four benchmarks at scale. A brief introduction to ML transformers, this is a picture of and transformer encoder. The inputs and embeddings feed into a multi-head attention layer, which is followed by a feed-forward layer. Just a summary of the math behind the transformer computation. The batch times embeddings is multiplied by uh, a hidden layer and then a hidden layer that is transposed in shape. And after these two matrix multiplication operations, the batch times model matrix input results in a batch times model matrix output. The key takeaway here is the compute to communication ratio, which is the compute intensity is two times dh flops per byte, where dh is the hidden dimension per worker. And uh, what does this tell us? What this tells us is if the hidden dimension is 16,000, we have 16 workers, the compute intensity is about 2048 flops per byte, which is pretty good even over a remote network, for example, the Google network or an infinite band network. When we increase this to 64 workers, this ratio reduces to 512 flops per byte, where it can be uh, challenging to optimize and communication overheads start to dominate. Some mechanisms to model parallelize these large models. First is pipelining, where each layer is assigned to a different accelerator. This works very well when we have lots of layers and the number of accelerators is uh, related to the number of layers. If you want to go further than the number of layers, we can use mesh TensorFlow where we train on a large virtual 2D mesh with two dimensions, the feature dimension and the batch dimension. Uh, mesh TensorFlow executes all reduce uh, calls along both dimensions to some 
partial sums in the distributed matrix multiplication and compute gradients along uh, the batch dimension. Uh, the G shard uh, approach trains mixture of experts. It enables model parallelism of all the workers, and it also uses all to all for the workers to communicate with each other. A brief introduction to model parallelism versus data parallelism. How do the parameters look? In data parallelism, we have several replicas and each worker has, has its own copy of weights. In model parallelism, there's only one global copy of weights, and this is split amongst all the workers. The more popular approach is a mixed mode of data and model parallelism, where the weights are replicated on a few workers, and then in a group of workers, they're actually split. This is shown in the last picture. This gets more interesting when we are looking at inputs. With inputs in data parallelism, we have a single pool of examples, and each worker gets a split of the global pool of examples. With model parallelism, the popular implementation is each worker uh, works off its own pool of examples. And for example, with pipelining, it would apply the example on a subset of layers. With mixed mode, this becomes a little tricky. Uh, not only do we split uh, the pool of examples amongst the workers, we may also need to split the example itself, an ind individual example, amongst the workers in, in the model parallelism group. This is shown by the two mechanisms of splitting. So how are the dot einsens, which is a very popular matrix multiplication operation for transformers uh, split and parallelized. Uh, this is actually shown in the first picture. Here we have a batch times model matrix, which is uh, distributed across four workers, marked 0, 1, and 2, and 3. In this case, we are looking at worker 1. And what we do first is we do an all gather to accumulate the inputs. And uh, we get the entire batch times model matrix uh, this could be for a single layer, so the activation size can still be contained. And then the batch times model matrix is multiplied with the first hidden layer and then the next hidden layer. And then we get the same batch times model matrix. And then we could do a reduce scatter operation and then each worker only needs to store a shard of the activation. This is important in the forward pass because we want to store as little information as possible uh, from the forward pass uh, because it, the activations will be reused again in the backward pass. Uh, note we can uh, use <clears throat> various algorithms presented in literature. For example, the 1D, 2D, and 2.5D Cannon's algorithms. The, the one I presented is very similar to 1D Cannon's algorithm. Uh, the 2.5D Cannon's algorithm can reduce communication by uh, storing more data and, and, and replicating more, and, and such opportunities could be used to reduce communication overheads, e even in transformers. And how do we map the transformer workload to a large n-dimensional mesh? Uh, the simplest way would be to use one dimension for model parallelism and, and potentially the remainder of the dimensions for data parallelism, this would work for a model that doesn't fit on a single accelerator, but fits on a few accelerators. And then you could execute the all reduce for gradients on the data parallelism dimensions and the collectives for the model parallelism on, on the single dimension uh, that is used. If you want to scale out, we could use a single dimension for data parallelism or potentially a subset of dimensions for data parallelism and the remainder of dimensions for model parallelism. So model parallelism would be across a larger number of workers, enabling uh, a much larger model to run. Uh, a, a more interesting scheme that uh, we have been using is, is to have mixed mode, where activations could be split on a subset of dimensions of the n-dimensional mesh, uh, and weights could be split on the remainder of the dimensions. 
and, and note when weights are split in the same dimens dimensions as data parallelism, we effectively get a distributed optimizer. And with the distributed optimizer, the overhead of updating weights is parallelized. And, and note in language models with very large weights, this overhead can be significant. And when implemented this way, with activation sharding and weight sharding in, in orthogonal dimensions, we see nice speed ups. So what are the scalability challenges? The biggest scalability challenge is debugging. My model doesn't run at scale, so what do I do? Uh, one of the ways of debugging is to potentially run the model at a smaller scale, maybe with more aggressive parallelism. For example, flip the model parallelism and the data parallelism dimensions. Or uh, maybe reduce the number of layers. Uh, often transformers have layers which are identical. And at a smaller scale, you could run a smaller number of layers to see what the behavior is. Maybe the, the noise is coming from changing the number of layers or having a very large number of layers. And in, in fact, debugging can be a huge challenge. The loss doesn't always continue to reduce, and maybe the model can start learning. Or often there are blips. Uh, for example, it could be a NAN. And, and uh, simple techniques like a, a, a NAND skip, where the na if the gradient becomes NAND, you just skip the step. Th th these are typically available in, in most uh, ML training platforms like TensorFlow or PyTorch, could be adopted. In, in addition, uh, fine tuning enables transfer learning. And, and what we're trying to do here is we train a model, a large model on a very large data set, and then we fine tune it on a smaller data set to produce a high quality model for that data set. And, and fine tuning may require us to large with a, excuse me, run with a very large number of weights and hence news uh, require many accelerators. And sometimes this can be a challenge and, and fine tuning loss could, could be optimized the same way as the standard training loss. For performance, uh, the biggest challenge is overlapping communication with computation. Communication not only increases with the size of the model, it could also change with uh, the type of model parallelism and how it's mapped. And, and often, uh, the bigger the machine uh, and, and bigger the model, the more challenging it is to optimize communication. In, in addition to standard collectives, uh, we also had to develop strided collectives. In a strided collective, the inner dimensions of the tensor are split across uh, a particular model parallelism dimension. And, and when this happens uh, on the network, we must transfer uh, strided accesses from memory. So DMAs from strided axes should be very, very fast. And, and this is, becomes very useful. In, in addition, uh, uh, a, a, a standard technique for overlapping computation and communication is, is gradient reduction, which basically uh, overlaps with the forward and backward pass. This is a very popular technique. It, is, uh, it, it, it basically enables a given layer gradient computation to overlap with the next layer's backward pass computation or potentially any layer uh, preceding that layer's forward pass. And, and it could also overlap with the weight update. But note, in, in a large giant model, the gradient update communication is not the only source of communication overhead. The, the distributed matrix multiplication, in fact, has higher communication overheads, and these dominate the total step time. And, and a possible uh, nice way is to use uh, the over-decomposition approach, which has been presented in the Charm++ programming model, uh, also to overlap computation and communication. So essentially here, you split a mini batch assigned to worker uh, to something more fine-grained. In this case, we show a four-way split. And the coll collectives preceding the compute could be overlapped. For example, here, the all gather of a later split is overlapped with the compute in a previous split, and similarly, the reduced scatter is scheduled after the compute and overlaps with compute as a, 
uh, compute in, in a future split as well. And, and in, in, in this way, we can always have some communication and some computation always running. Node overlap is only effective when computation and communication are comparable. And uh, what is the exact mechanism of scheduling computation communication? Uh, we, we tried two approaches. One is a dynamic coprocessor mode where one of the two uh, TPU cores can selectively become a communication processor and it can rapidly make pro progress on communication. This is uh, uh, good when uh, we have very communication dominated matrix multiplication operations. When the MATMOL is compute dominated, uh, we could use a decomposed collective approach where a collective is uh, split into small DMAs and these DMAs are scheduled at the top of the outer loops of convolutions. And when the convolution compute is complete, the DMAs would also have completed. And we get nice overlap of computation and communication. Uh, some preliminary performance results, our collaborators will present more detailed performance results in future papers. This shows a giant model with XXX billion parameters, and we see a 14 percent speed up, the step time is reduced from around 13.3 seconds to 11.6 seconds. And note in the left side, which shows the before optimization uh, percentage of each computation, uh, the convolutions are around 60%, and then the collectives are between 30 to 35%. Uh, there are various flavors and marked in uh, I think for reductions is orange and, and for all gather is, is, is blue and, and there's a little bit of send receive and there's a little bit of other computation which typically is result uh, is, is basically serial operations such as uh, local broadcasts and reductions in the accelerator. After the uh, overlap we see uh, uh, we have a overlap matrix multiplication which is about 20%. And note the other term actually goes up a bit because now we have uh, more scalar operations to do splits and concats uh, to do the over decomposition. But, but net, net effect uh, in, is, is still 14%. So this is still a strong win. To summarize uh, large models, it can be very challenging to train and debug them and, and communication overheads uh, and optimizing them is, is very, very important. And, and note network throughput must scale, uh, not only with the size of compute as you make it compute, bigger you need to make, uh, give it more network throughput, but also the number of accelerators as you scale out to a bigger size. The relative compute when model paralyzes, uh, model paralyzed becomes smaller, so the network throughput may need to scale further. If you want to run a bigger model at a bigger scale, we need even more network throughput. And, and we have, wherever possible, we have tried to benefit from HPC literature. I think we give examples of Canon's algorithms and over decomposition. You can take questions now. Thank you. Thank you, Samir. Great talk. I'm going to use uh, the upvotes uh, uh, to identify which Slack question to ask first. So there's one from Ritika from NVIDIA. What is the difference in the Taurus network of TPU version 3 and TPU version 4? Samir? Samir, are you able to hear me? He took his headphones off. Yeah. Slack. Just 
Yes, yeah, Samir, we can hear you. So, so move on to the next talk. Okay. So, uh, we had some. Yeah. So, we are moving on to the next talk. Um, there's some. Uh, maybe I'll ask Samir to take the questions. I'll ask Samir to take the questions in the Slack. So uh, moving on to the second segment of the large language model talks, um, we, have, uh, we have here the DeepSpeed team from Microsoft. They focus not only on scaling perf and efficiency in this talk and, and their work, but also how their efforts lead to democrat democratizing and making the models accessible to a larger population. Our first speaker for this talk uh, will be Yu Shang He. She is a research manager at Microsoft. She works on performance optimization of parallel and distributed systems, such as machine learning systems, information retrieval, data management, and large scale cloud infrastructure. Her more recent work focuses on optimizing deep learning systems. She leads deep speed and deep CPU projects, which strive for orders of magnitude improvement on speed and scale for deep learning training and inference. She will be followed by Samyam Rajbhandari, who is a researcher at Microsoft with a background in high performance computing. He works on developing high-performance infrastructures for accelerating large-scale deep learning training and inference on parallel and distributed systems. He developed the core technology in deep CPU and deep speed, resulting in orders of magnitude improvement on speed and scale for DL inference and training. His recent work on memory optimization has enabled training of very large models, including the 17.2 billion Turing NLG model from Microsoft. We will also have Olatunji Ruwasi from MSR joining us for the Q&A sessions. Olatunji's current research is in systems and convergence techniques for efficient large-scale training and serving of deep learning models. Hello, I'm Yixiong He from Microsoft. Today, my colleague, Senyan Rajhandri, and I would like to share with you DeepSpeed, our deep learning optimization library towards speed and scale. We may all experience a challenge of DL training and inference. For example, it's slow to train high quality models on massive data. We constantly encounter problems like out of memory, low throughput, slow convergence. Furthermore, the optimization ideas and techniques are often scattered. How to use them collectively and conveniently is non-trivial. Similarly, to perform inference on a trained DL model can be slow and expensive. All this motivate our work on deep speed, directly targeted on the challenges we observe, striking for three E's. Efficiency for high throughput and scalability, effectiveness for fast convergence, and easy to use for improved development productivity. What is deep speed? DeepSpeed is a DL training and inference optimization library. On the software stack, DeepSpeed is the optimization layer standing between DL models and DL frameworks. Among the frameworks, we primarily support PyTorch. Users can leverage performance benefit of DeepSpeed with just a few lines of code changes on their PyTorch model. Here's an example of BERT model. It shows the changes required to use DeepSpeed. The primary change is to call DeepSpeed initialize to wrap the model and optimize it. Then you can think of this wrapped model as a DeepSpeed engine, and then with similar syntax as regional, use it for forward, backward path, and parameter update. And that's it, minimal code changes. Then DeepSpeed will handle the underlying performance challenges and apply its efficiency and effectiveness optimizations. That leads to speed and scale.
More specifically, DeepSpeed excels in six areas. Model skill, speed, democratizing AI, compressed training, accelerated inference, and good usability, which we'll talk into one by one. With respect to model skill, classic data parallel approach runs out of memory for models with more than 1.4 billion parameters. Model parallelism with tensor slicing can only scale within a single node with up to 8 or 16 GPUs as a model scale of up to 20 billion parameters. Training efficiency drops significantly beyond that due to intensive communication. In comparison, deep speed has continued to advance the frontier of large-scale model training. In February 2020, we introduced a system breakthrough, zero, standing for zero redundancy optimizer, to conquer the memory and scaling challenge of very large models. Zero significantly reduces memory footprint while retaining compute and communication efficiency. In the first stage, Zero One allows DeepSpeed to run 100 billion parameter models efficiently. It also part of training of Turing NLG 17 billion parameter model, the largest model by then. In May 2020, we released Zero Two, which adds novel memory optimization on top of Zero One and unblocks 200 billion parameter model training. In September of the same year, we released 3D parallelism, a flexible combination of zero-part data parallelism with model and pattern parallelism. This allows us to run models with trillion parameters, obtaining close to perfect memory and throughput scaling. In March 2021, we released 03, supporting trillion parameter model using zero-part data parallelism alone greatly reducing the burden of model developers to perform surgical changes to skill their models through model parallelism. A month after that, we released the ultimate version of Zero technology, which we call Zero Infinity. Zero Infinity breaks the GPU memory wall for extreme skill deep learning. It powers unprecedented model sizes by leveraging the full memory capacity concurrently exploring all heterogeneous memory, GPU, CPU, and NVMe. On 512v100 GPUs, it supports over 30 trillion parameters, 50x larger than state-of-the-art. Stanya will have a deeper dive into it shortly. Besides scale, deep speed also excels in speed. For example, we developed the ultra-fast transformer kernels on GPUs that leads to the fastest bird training. We also developed novel data parallelism approach powered by zero and zero infinity for scalable distributed training. For large models with multi-billion and trillion parameters, zero-part data parallelism obtains superlinear speedup with increasing number of GPUs. Because it intelligently leverages the aggregated PCIe, CPU memory, and NVMe memory bandwidth, with in, which increases with the GPU count. Besides zero and ultra-fast GPU kernels, we have an extended list of techniques to boost both system efficiency and convergence effectiveness to accelerate training. Another mission of DeepSpeed is to democratize DR training for everyone in need. From DeepSpeed webinar survey, we realized that more than half of our users only have one to four GPUs, but they do hope to explore advanced DL models and benefit from it. We pushed out zero offload and zero infinity for these users. This offloading technology leverage CPU, GPU, and NVMe memory for training large models. Using a machine with a single GPU, our users can run models of up to 1 trillion parameters without running out of memory. This is 700x bigger than the existing approaches while obtaining competitive throughput. This feature democratizes multi-billion parameter model training using a single GPU. Another innovation is one-bit atom. 
it reduces communication volume of a regional atom by up to 5x while achieving similar convergence efficiency. In communication constraint scenario like using Ethernet, we observe up to 3.5x faster training. One bit atom democratizes distributed training and powers our users to scale on different types of GPU clusters and networks. Next area is compressed training. Deep speed use condensed form to represent store, compute, and communicate information, saving resources and boosting efficiency. One example is deep speed sparse attention. Compared with classic dense transformers, our efficient sparse kernels supports 10x longer sequence of model input and up to 6x faster training. This is a core feature to enable long text image and sound processing. Our second example of compressed training is progressive layer dropping. Comparing with sparse attention, it shows compressed training at a different granularity, more constraint at transformer layer level. At each training iteration, we carefully drop a subset of layers, reducing training time cost per iteration. What's surprising is that this doesn't hurt accuracy. Instead, it obtains comparable accuracy with faster convergence and more robust fine-tuning results. Some of you know that DeepSpeed started from optimizing training. After a while, the most frequent request we receive from our users is, thanks to DeepSpeed, I can now train large models, but how can I run inference on them efficiently? This motivates our work of optimizing large-scale model inference. Deep speed inference has three lines of technologies. First, inference adapted parallelism that partitions the model across multiple GPUs and adapts the best parallel strategy for inference latency and cost. Second, inference optimized kernels that boost per GPU efficiency through deep fusion and novel kernel scheduling. Third, model compression where we propose powerful new methods for quantized-aware training and develop high-performance quantized kernels, saving memory, reducing latency without hurting accuracy. Altogether, deep speed inference supports large-scale models with tens and hundreds of billions of parameters. It delivers two to six times faster and cheaper inference compared with existing work. Last but definitely not the least, DeepSpeed is easy to use. With only a few lines of code changes, we can enable PyTorch model to use DeepSpeed. Furthermore, DeepSpeed enables our users to train large models with up to 1 trillion parameters using their love data parallelism without worrying about model parallelism. In contrast, without DeepSpeed, models beyond 1.4 billion will run out of memory with data parallelism alone while using model parallels often request major code changes on the user models. In addition, popular DL libraries like Hugging Face and PyTorch Lightning integrate DeepSpeed as a performance optimized backend. Their users can leverage DeepSpeed even easier through just a command line or a simple configuration change. Yet another point on usability. DeepSpeed is infrastructure agnostic. Users can leverage it on their favorite environment like Azure ML, MPI-based systems, local nodes, and so on. This completes the overview of DeepSpeed. In summary, we drive innovations and share system breakthroughs to offer exceptional skill speed, efficiency, and good usability. Next, my colleague Sen Yan will dive into a new and powerful technology introduced by DeepSpeed team. Zero Infinity. Thank you, Yuzhong. Hello, everyone. My name is Samyam Rajbandari. I work with Yuzhong in the DeepSpeed team. And in this part of the talk, I'll be introducing Zero Infinity, a powerful DL training technology that addresses some of the key challenges in training really large models. In the last two years, the model size has increased by almost 240 times, whereas the amount of memory on a single GPU device has just nearly doubled. It is no longer possible to fit these really large models on a single GPU device, 
And to address this, um, DL training system technology has evolved as well, and now it offers uh, solutions that can combine multiple forms of parallelism, such as tensor slicing, uh, pipeline parallelism, and zero, so that it can use the aggregate GPU memory on a cluster to train these really large models. So given this uh, large model training landscape, uh, there are three questions that arises. First, um, how do we support the continuous growth in model size as we uh, arrive close to the GPU memory wall, where it is no longer possible to fit the model for training even with all the aggregate GPU memory available in a cluster. Second, once we actually train a large model, how do we make it accessible to more data scientists? For example, if we consider GPT-3, which is about 175 billion parameters, it takes 256 GPUs just to fit this model for training, and a lot of data scientists do not have access to such resources. And then finally, the system technology powering these large models requires a complex combination of multiple forms of parallelism and enabling 3D parallelism-like technology that combines tensor slicing and pipeline parallelism requires significant model refactoring, which is uh, quite painful and error-prone. So can we really simplify the training pipeline um, to make it easier for data scientists to scale their models? So in this talk, um, I will be introducing Zero Infinity uh, that addresses these three questions. First, let's start with the GPU memory wall. We all know modern GPU clusters have heterogeneous memory systems. So for example, if we take a look at the NVIDIA DGX2 node, it has about 30 terabytes of memory in NVMe, CPU, and GPU memory combined. And GPU memory actually makes up for less than 2% of the total memory. If we could use all this memory together, then you could fit a 1 trillion parameter on a single DTX2 node or a 32 trillion parameter on 32 such nodes. A model as large as GPT-3 could be fine-tuned on just a single node. So how do we go and leverage this non-GPU memory? Could we just extend an existing parallel training technology to use CPU or, or NVMe memory? So let's look at some of the candidate technologies. If we look at data parallelism, it replicates data across um, uh, multiple GPUs. And so this replication causes a memory explosion, so it, it simply doesn't work. Tensor slicing, on the other hand, cannot scale across multiple nodes, so it cannot leverage um, CPU, GPU, or NVMe uh, memory across nodes. And if you look at pipeline parallelism, pipeline parallelism works great, has good efficiency, can scale across nodes, but it requires significant code refactoring, which, um, which makes it challenging for data scientists to use. But what about the zero redundancy optimizer? It scales efficiently across nodes and can scale to trillions of parameters, and no model code refactoring is necessary. So let's take a quick uh, look at what zero redundancy optimizer does. So zero redundancy optimizer, or zero, is a more memory efficient form of para uh, data parallelism. Unlike data parallelism where model states are replicated, um, zero creates a mutually exclusive subset of parameters across all the GPUs. Essentially, it partitions the parameter across all the GPUs. Then during the training, when a particular parameter is needed, the GPU that owns that parameter will broadcast that parameter across all the GPUs. This way, zero can fully leverage the aggregate GPU memory uh, on a, in a cluster without any replication. To understand if we can extend zero to use CPU and NVMe memory, we performed a bottleneck analysis where we identified the minimum bandwidth required by different tensors during training for zero to remain efficient. So on a DGX2 system, we found that the minimum bandwidth required is 60 gigabytes per second for parameters and gradients, 1500 gigabytes per second for optimizer states, and just four gigabytes per second for activations. Then we studied the data partitioning and data access pattern in zero to understand the achievable bandwidth for these different data types when they are placed in CPU or NVMe memory. Without going into much detail, we found that we can extend zero um, to support offload of optimizer states to NVMe memory and activations to CPU memory without much efficiency uh, degradation 
but the parameters and gradients had to stay in GPU memory. The reason for that was because zero uh, stores each parameter at a unique GPU location, which means that it can be only um, moved to and from the CPU or NVMe memory using a single PCIe link, and that PCIe link bandwidth is the bottleneck. Now, in order to improve upon that, we redesigned zero such that each parameter is partitioned across all GPUs instead of assigning it to a single GPU. And when that parameter is needed, we use an all gather operation instead of a broadcast operation so that that parameter can be available on, on all GPUs. And with that modification, we are no longer limited by the PCIe bandwidth of a single link. Instead, we are now limited by the all gather bandwidth between GPUs and that is enough to satisfy our minimum bandwidth requirement. And we call this uh, modified version of zero uh, to support offloading of all the different data types, zero infinity. Okay, so now let's take a look at how zero fin infinity works in action. So here we have a six GPU cluster where there are two GPUs per node, each with its own CPU and NVMe memory. We're going to train a three layer model. Each layer has its own parameter. First, these parameters are partitioned across all the GPUs, but instead of storing them in the GPU, they're actually stored in, in NVMe memory. Then during the forward pass, when they're needed, they, they are first moved to the GPU, and then they are all gathered over the network. And then you compute the activation during the forward pass. We repeat that for all three layers. Then during the backward pass, you all gather the parameters, compute your gradients, you average them, and then you partition them and you store them back in NVMe. So you repeat that again for all the layers. Now, once all the gradients have been computed, you can update your parameters in parallel by moving them from NVMe to CPU and updating them directly in CPU, then bringing back the updated parameters back to the NVMe memory, and that completes one iteration of zero infinity. Now let's take a look at the evaluation of zero infinity. In terms of model scale, it can support models as large as 100 trillion parameters on 128 DGX2 nodes. On a single node, it can support models as large as a trillion parameters. In terms of efficiency, it achieves over 40 teraflops per GPU and is quite comparable to the state-of-the-art 3D parallelism that works just out of GPU memory. And in terms of scaling, it actually achieves super linear scalability by um, leveraging the aggregate um, NVMe to, to GPU memory, which increases as you increase the number of GPUs. So circling back to where we started, we posed three questions regarding a large model training landscape. How do we overcome the GPU memory wall? How do we make large model training more accessible? And how do we avoid model code refactoring? Well, with zero infinity, it redefines this landscape um, by going beyond the GPU memory wall it presents broader access for large model training, allowing GPT-3 size models to be fine-tuned on a single DGX2 node. It, uh, it achieves excellent throughput and scalability. And in terms of uh, model refactoring, it requires uh, virtually no model refactoring. So that's the end of the deep speed uh, talk on Zero Infinity. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, for more information, please check out www.deepspeed.ai. Thank you. Okay, hopefully we don't have any more audio issues. So we won't have Samyang join, joining us for Q&A because he's in a different time zone, but we will have Ola Tunji representing him and Yushang who gave the first part of the talk. So thank you for the talk guys, um, it was awesome. I, I have three couple of questions in the Slack. So starting from the first one, uh, this is from Natalia Vasileva from Cerebra Systems. Um, have you attempted to train 30 trillion parameter models to convergence 
Um, if yes, how long does it take? And how long would it take to train a one trillion parameter model on a single GPU? Nishan. Okay, thanks, Yushan. The next question is from Swapnil Sakharshete. Since Zero Infinity heavily makes use of CPU, CPU, NVMe, and DDR capacities across multiple nodes, do you see reduced pressure on GPU, HBM capacities as we scale these models in future? Thanks, Ulatanjay. The next question is from uh, Hai Anam. Uh, she is asking if uh, to use deep speed with models using the TensorFlow framework, it is only a few lines of code changes. Uh, are there limits to the usability of deep speed? Yeah, I believe the another way to spin the question is uh, so deep speed is limited to PyTorch users. Wow. Yes, any plans to extend so? Um, no. Okay. Uh, uh, there are a couple of questions coming. I can see people typing, so I'm going to give them some time to type. I know we are a bit over, quite a lot over time. So I'm going to pose you um, a rather controversial question. Uh, you can choose to answer or, uh, you know, uh, you do mention that uh, you guys are using up to 30 trillion, up to 30 trillion parameters using zero infinity. And in the previous talk, Samir mentioned, uh, gave a reference to the neural scaling laws from OpenAI, where GPT-3 was at 2 billion parameters. So uh, it, it's, it's neat that within one GPU, you can train up to you know, 1 trillion parameter model. But um, you know, given the debate going on on uh, the amount of resources, the amount of data set that's needed to train such large language models, have you, are you having some internal discussions? Can you share some thoughts on uh, what, what factors are taken into consideration, going a bit more greener? Um, I think from our perspective, that, uh, that uh, there's a, there's a strong need for, 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 for
the 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 theme of like like to what that feels was that I think um we primarily provide the system of ability to enable people that enable model scientists to be able to create models of those skills that if they see these kind of skills is able to provide the kind of quality of accuracy in lines of capability that they are not able to achieve in the current scale. So I think the main focus of the HD study is really on the part of having the having the software, having the having the system level of the support to enable people to do what they hope you need a lot of to do what they hope to do that uh, around the area. And thought that what um commentary that I will for different models to what level they can continue to achieve accuracy and so on. I think that part is is beyond the scope of of our study. But it's it's certainly very interesting aspects that to to discuss that yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Yushan. I'll just take a couple more questions if that's okay. So uh, this is something that I wanted to ask the previous speaker as well. Uh, uh, Natalia is asking, can you share any details on your experiments with respect to sparsity and training sparse models? So, um, Actually, one line of starting, for example, is using the NOE that we call passwords. That is a form of cross-race passing. That for the NDCs, we actually have a reason to believe a lead is not validated around this one. That I think that could be an interesting value. That uh, if anyone interested in it, please also feel free to check out our website and our blog post on that one. That's certainly one form of study. Okay. Thanks, Yushan. Um, the next one uh, is from Mahmoud. If you train MOE's uh, mixture of export sparse, sparse model, will you still have enough computation to have? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have a couple more questions, but I'm going to let the speakers handle them offline. Uh, we are 15 minutes over time. Thank you so much for joining us today for the tutorial session. Uh, we apologize for the interruption in the Q&A uh, due to audio issues. The speakers in the Slack will continue to interact with you if you were to pose questions to them. Please join us back at 2.30 p.m. Pacific time for uh, the next tutorial session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.